This is all so exciting. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. This is an incredible event that we have. And um, hello, my name, uh, hello and welcome. My name is Elena Maria Viramontes, and I'm delighted to share this year's Freund Prize for Creative Writing alumni reading with my fo fellow creative writing colleague, John Lennon. At this time, I wish to extend our gratitude to the creative writing director, Aishan Hutchinson, in addition, in addition to the chair of our department, uh, Andrew Galloway. I would also like to recognize the staff of our Department of Literatures in English, who are the hidden labor that make our events and celebrations a continued success. And finally, a brief shout out to our former colleague, Professor Maureen McCoy, who at one point or another touched the lives of all four of today's presentations, or presenters. Maureen, yes. Yeah. <laughs> OK, now for some business. Please silence your phones. Due to the already long program, there will not be a Q&A in the auditorium after, in the auditorium, but after the reading, you can attend the book signing and ask questions of our alumni at the reception immediately following. And it, it'll be upstairs in the English Department Lounge at 258 Goldwyn Smith. Books are available uh, for purchase uh, with partnership from uh, the Buffalo Street Books after the reading, and they just look terrific. I mean, it's just wonderful. OK. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayokono. The Gayokono are members of the Haudenosaunee, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Gayokono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of the Gayokono people past, present, to these lands and waters. Now let me give you a little, uh, a little history about Philip Freund. Some of you may be aware that graduates of our MFA program are eligible to teach here at Cornell as lecturers in English for the two years following their graduation. These lectureships are paid for in part by the generosity of Philip Freund, Cornell class of 1929, who's still, uh, uh, whose will provided our program with an endowment intended to benefit creative writing graduate students. Since 2011, the Philip Freund Creative Writing Fund has enabled us to offer Freund lectureships to graduates of our MFA program. Philip Freund's generosity did not end there, however. The Freund endowment has also made it possible in a new light for our graduates. We offer now the Philip Freund Prize for Creative Writing, an award intended to honor our graduates who have gone on to publish outstanding works of fiction. The Freund Prize enables us to provide a monetary award of $5,000 <laughs> and also extend invitations to return to campus, not as alumni, but as successful and meaningful writers to be cherished and celebrated. With those words, I'd like to begin by introducing the first writer. I first encountered Manuel Munoz's work while reading his application about three weeks after I began my position here at Cornell in the spring of 1995. When the admissions committee met, Michael Cook turned to us and said at the start of our meeting, should we all agree now that Munoz should be given a slot? It never happened before, I've been told, and it hasn't happened since. Such was the storytelling strength of writing that this 23-year-old Chicano, born in the outskirts of Fresno from a farm-working family, given a scholarship to Harvard, and weathered its non-diverse curriculum, not only surviving with remarkable resiliency, but also holding fast to cultural roots. He arrived in Ithaca quietly reserved 
but his presence made my own thoughts about being at Cornell disappear. After the publication of his newest collection of stories, The Consequences, published by Grey Wolf, I described Manuel in an interview as saying he has, quote, a very radical talent with a sense of values that nobody can teach, a way of feeling injustice in his own bones and having the strength and, and morality to do something about it through literature. With his new collection of short stories, The Consequences, he has hit his stride of confident, quiet authority that is simply impossible to ignore. Munoz is the author of two previous collections of short stories, Zigzagger and The Faith Healer of Olive Avenue, which was shortlisted for the 20, 20, <laughs> 27 <laughs> Ford O'Connor International Short Story Award, and a novel, What You See in the Dark. Munoz is the recipient of a Whiting Writers Award. I don't know why I'm so nervous. <laughs> Three of his short stories have received O. Henry Awards, and one was chosen for the best American short stories. A native of De, De Bayou, como? De Ube, De Ube, California, Munoz has been on the faculty of the University of Arizona's creative writing program since 2008. God, Manuel, I'm so happy to see you here. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I want to thank the students as well who joined us for a moment of community at lunchtime. It was really phenomenal. And I want to extend my congratulations to my colleagues. It's been just wonderful sharing a little bit of time with you in some community. Um, I'm just really, really, really proud to get this. Um, and I want to thank the family of Philip Freund for making it possible for all of us to be celebrated in this way. I want to read just a little bit of a story called, with a very long title, That Pink House at the End of the Street on the Other Side of Town, which I, if I tried to put in a workshop, I have a feeling I'd get a correction <laughs> somewhere in there. Um, I'm, I, we were talking a little bit about poetry today with the students, and I'm hoping that this was maybe as a callback to some things I was doing in, in my first book, Zigzaggers, in some sections. And I'm just going to read the first four sections of this story. That pink house at the end of the street on the other side of town. One, Silvio, whom everyone called El Sapo, had been coming the longest, but only during the wet times when the fields ran muddy and no one else would brave the kind of cold that would lock your knuckles, no matter how thick the gloves. By spring, he'd return to a pueblito called Pozos, which made everyone ask why he'd go back to a hole in the ground. A frog crawling under the mud to wait out the heat. That was El Sapo, leaving sometime in early April before the heat came. And then the others would arrive. Fidelio and his twin brother Modesto, who for some reason was several inches shorter than him. Jerónimo, quiet and stark, who claimed to know Silvio, but nobody knew for sure. Baldomero, el mero mero, who boasted he was the one who had shown the others how to start with a bus in Celaya, take it to the outskirts of Tijuana, and right over there at a llanteria owned by his old friend Raimundo, you could sneak through the dust yard of Raimundo's old tires and cross to the other side, get to the highway on foot, and if you were smart enough to hide your money, catch a greyhound to a place called Goshen, where you'd go to the phone booth outside of the station, look out at the cotton fields as you dialed a number, and told a man named Poldo that you'd made it across. A cousin by way of another cousin, a friend of the family, from Celaya, from Ojo de Agua, from La Cuevita, from Charco Blanco. Yes, yes, of course, a third yes if you promised you had the money to pay a little rent for a month. That's how Eliseo showed up. And poor Casimiro, 
who wore thick glasses and peered into the fruit trees with his whole face to see what he was picking. But you'd have to know Spanish to know why all the other men laughed at his name. Two. Poldo was Leopoldo Ruelas, as thin as his mustache, who came out of nowhere and bought that pink house at the end of the street on the other side of town. That house had stood empty for a long time, the paint chipped and the weeds growing high in the bank, only sometimes coming to clean up the yard. Not often because it wasn't a town where just anybody could buy a house. People rented, and when they passed by the faded pink house with the enclosed back porch and wished they could one day be its owner, Poldo had to be born here to do that by this house. Mexicano, of course, but he knew how to get the kind of money to get a bank to talk to you. And he had a pretty wife who was taller than him, Belen, who led a toddler by one hand and cradled the baby with the other. And maybe it was she who decided to paint the house pink again. That was one reason people thought she was from Mexico. If you bothered to dream about a house, only a true Mexican would dream about a pink one or one that was bright orange up on a hill somewhere looking down at everything else in drab colors or worse, unpainted wood. Belen, who always wore dresses and high heels and knew just the store in Fresno where you could get a good deal on clothing de buenas marcas. Her little ones not yet old enough for anyone to know their names, but one looked like her and the other one already had Boldo's rat face. Whether she was from over here or over there, Belen was the kind of person who had long ago stopped thinking about those days in some pueblito where you hoped into a little luck with a piglet given by a generous neighbor. She had dresses now and a family, a husband who could walk into a bank. She didn't have to sit around wondering if she should butcher the piglet or fatten it up, feed it the scraps, or save them for herself, the hunger now or the hunger later. Three, Boldo's truck left one morning and was gone for about an hour, which was just about time for the ida y vuelta to the bus station in Goshen, the one that sat out by the edge of the, corn, the cotton field. He came back with one person. That's how Eliseo showed up. And just in time, too, because it was May and the fruit was coming in early. Boldo needed every hand he could get. Things were too busy to ask too many questions about why Eliseo had come up all alone or about exactly how he knew El Sapo or where he got all that money that he kept pulling out of his socks, the left front pocket of his brand new Wrangler jeans, the shirt pocket of his long sleeve. He wouldn't last more than a week in the fields, some of them said. Too slender, too quiet, and drinking only one can of beer? When he showed up, that made at least seven men from the other side sleeping on the enclosed back porch of the pink house at the end of that street. He wouldn't last, some of them said. He'd miss his mother too much. And with a name like that, too sweet for a full-grown man, you knew something bad was bound to happen to him. Four, the only one who ever made enough money to keep was Poldo. He hit them up for every dollar and he asked them when he couldn't say no at the Goshen bus station for space on the back porch to sleep at night, a Saturday night collection to buy carne asada and tortillas and beer a Sunday collection for a sack of beans to last the week, for a ride out to the fields in the back of the truck, for the favor of having Belen stand in line at the Western Union office to send money home and coming back with the receipt. Sometimes a few dollars interest for having loaned out a week's pay to get started. You needed your own cutting knife, your own gloves, your own wide brim, your own caso y costal, another pair of pants, work shirts, a fresh pack of underwear. Everyone with the same calcetines blancos hanging from the clotheslines, 
just a few dollars more from everyone for a white bucket of detergent, a bottle of bleach. The washing machine outside by the tool shed sat idle all weekend, but you could slip Belen a few dollars, and she'd have your clothes clean and folded on the back porch by sundown's return from the fields. And for the ones who couldn't always bear so much of the men's laughter in the backyard and the bored exhaustion around sundown, Boldo left them with just enough in their pockets for niceties, like a bottle of Tres Flores or Lucky Tiger or English leather, something to put on for an evening walk into town and a beer at John Henry's. Just enough for a few last coins to drop in the jukebox a baile or two with a woman kind enough to say yes, but who wished she was someplace else. Thank you. Wow, Manuel, that was beautiful. Thank you. I mean, were you 23 years old at that time? I'm the love you. <laughs> but I, I did, but I do remember that uh, when I said your very presence made any doubts about me being here disappear. I was just so happy to be here with you, Manuel. Okay. Um, the dedication in Estela Gonzalez's beautifully imagined debut collection, Chola Salvation, reads, these cuentitos are for all the fierce chingonecks in and outside of Islos. Orale. The dedication best describes the characters and situation localized in East Los Angeles, one of the oldest working class Mexican American communities in the nation. The characters are not romantic notions of peoples, but what Gonzalez does best is to show the tenacity and spirit of their lives. What is most astonishing about Chola Salvation, I wrote, is Gonzalez's skill in, devout, in, in dropping the reader right into the action. Each story's razor-sharp characterizations allow us to recognize the bra bravada these, women, these mujeres live by, for better or for worse or to root for a queer love sought by hombres. With its bars, churches, hair salons, and neighbors, this collection presents Islos in its beautiful, aggrieved, celebratory finest. Originally from East Los Angeles, Gonzalez's work has appeared in anthologies such as Latinos and Locust Land, an anthology of contemporary Southern California literature and in literary journals, including the, the what is it, Kewaili? Oh, Kewaili. the Kewaili Journal, and Accentos, and uh, uh, Asterisk, and the uh, Huizache. Her writing has been recognized with a push card prize, special mention, and as a reading notable from the best American non-required reading. Chola Salvation was a finalist for the Louise Merriweather Book Prize for a collection of short fiction and a finalist for the best, uh, finalist for the best um, from James D. Houston Award for Western Literature. Orale, Estela, welcome back. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Elena. Um, another chingona from East LA. Yes. She's the main reason I came to Cornell. But, you know, I wanted to thank everybody for inviting me for the department and John and Maureen. And I remember you guys. And, and Sean, thank you so much. Um, but I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled, um, anyway, to see Elena again. So. <laughs> I was actually talking, I'm going to read the titular story, I don't know, can everybody hear me? Okay. Of uh, Chola Salvation, I kind of talked a little bit about it when we met with the students, <laughs> so um, here it is. 
I'm just kicking back, drinking my dad's schlitz when Frida Kahlo and the Virgen de Guadalupe walk into our restaurant. La Frida is in a man suit, a big baggy one like the guy from the Talking Heads, but this one's black, not white. All her hair is cut off, so she isn't wearing no braids, no ribbons, no nothing. The only woman thing she has on are those hand earrings. I read in Mrs. Herrera's class that Pablo Picasso gave her those earrings because he thought she was a better painter than her husband. La Virgen looks like my tia Rosa in the picture she sent to dad. She has blonde hair, lots of white eyeshadow, and she's wearing chola clothes. You know, tank top with those skinny little straps, baggy pants, and black hush puppy shoes, and she has on this lipstick like she has a bit of chocolate cake. Her hair is so long it touches the back of her feet. Her bangs are all sprayed up like a regular chola, but she wears a little gold crown. A badass vata loca sitting at the counter right in front of me. At first, I don't recognize them, but the moment I see Frida's unibrow and La Virgen's crown, I know. I really know for sure the moment Frida gives me a cigarette, even though there's this big old sign right at the counter saying, thank you for not smoking. I suck on it while La Virgen holds up a lighter. Que ondas, comadre, Frida says, smiling. What's up? One of her teeth is missing, and some of the others are all brown. No wonder she never smiles in her paintings. I don't know what to say, so I just take another swig from the beer I have behind the counter. Are you a shy girl, La Virgen says. Don't you know us, Essa? Man, sure I know you guys, I shout. I always shout when I'm a little buzzed. You want some coffee or something? Un cafecito y un platillo de menudo. ¿Y tú, Friducha? How about some pozole y unas cuantas tortillas de maíz, she says. So I serve them their menudo, pozole, tortillas, and coffee. They tell me they're here to give me some advice. Unos consejos. And believe me, you're going to need the advice, preciosa, Frida says, because your crazy mommy is going to let you have it with this whole quinceañera bullshit real soon. La Virgen nods and takes another puff. We're here to tell you you better watch out, La Virgen says. So we have some rules for you to live by. You know, like those Ten Commandments Father Jorge taught you. Yeah, but this, this isn't about God, Jesus, or some other Catholic laws, Frida says, ripping up her last tortilla. It's about you, homegirl, and about your pinche parents and this quinceañera they want to force down your throat, La Virgen, La Virgen tells me. You probably don't want to hear it from me, especially since your mom is always throwing me in your face, saying how much you're hurting me every time you don't listen to her. But I want you to hear it from me, not something your mom picked up from your abuela. I pull up a chair. I'm puffing away, the smoke relaxing me. I don't even feel, feel sick like those stupid films at school say, say you're supposed to. It's Sunday and mom has been at church since 6 a.m. She usually stays away until about 10 because she sells buñuelos and tamales out in front of the church to people getting out of mass. The restaurant's empty except for the three of us. I go over and lock the door, close the blinds, turn over the clothes sign, and scooch a chair in between my comadres. Frida leans over to me and takes my hand. La Virgen smiles and with her chocolate brown lips. Hermosa Isabella, your parents say they just want you to be a decent girl, Frida says. They want you to grow up with all those bourgeoisie ideas. If you have to drink to protect your soul, then do it. Just stop with the cheap beer. You're better off drinking your father's tequila. Then she pulls out a bottle of El Patron Silver and three shot glasses. She fills the little glass to the top for me. I take it, I take it down in one gulp, and it burns at first. But soon I'm on my second shot, trying to keep up with La Purísima Virgen, who's drinking like the stuff is water. How about another, she asks, handing me another cigarette. I notice her nails. They're painted blue, covered with little gold stars. It looks like she's holding a galaxy in her hands. How about taking up smoking, Frida says. See, I know I'm encouraging vices, but at your age you need all the help you can get. How about drinking? I have no idea when I started out, but before I knew it, I was challenging Leon Trotsky to tequila shots. Pobre cabron, he was no match for me, not even in bed. Then she asks me if I'm still a virgin. When I tell her I am, she shakes her head. Pobrecita, shy girl, La Virgen says. 
What? Did your mamita tell you to wait till your husband popped your cherry? Man, she's rough. If she wasn't La Virgen, I'd just think she was another one of those high school skanks. But she's La Virgen. She knows everything, and she's just telling it like it is. She told me only sluts had sex before they got married, I say. Those types of women end up pregnant or putas. They both look at each other and laugh again. Frida laughs so hard, she starts rolling around on the floor, kicking her feet. When she gets up, she's wiping tears from her eyes. Listen, preciosa, La Virgen says. I don't know if you know this, but your little pinchy saint of a mother had already started fucking your dad when she was 14. But she made the mistake of getting pregnant. Her mama, tu abuela, hadn't bothered to tell her about what girls and boys can do when they're hot for each other. If you decide to take up with men, be careful, Frida says. Capitalists, communists, they're all the same. If you're not careful, you'll end up like me, or even worse, your mother. I loved a man, a great artist, who just couldn't respect me as a wife. Fidelity is for the bourgeoisie, Diego would say. Well, thanks to the bourgeoisie, I painted the most miserable pieces of art ever. Maybe men aren't so bad, now that I think about it. Yes, men are another worthy vice. Just then, the two of them start arguing over who's fucked the most men. Well, cabrona, you started like 3,000 years before me, Frida gives in. <laughs> La Virgen smiles, sucks on her teeth, and says, yeah, way before Johnny Cortez. I would already had about 50,000 papacitos. Mmm, maybe more. At least I had Trotsky, Frida says. And you're proud of that? Frida's unibrow scrunches up, and I think for sure she's going to throw her cigarette in La Virgen's face. La Virgen ignores her, makes a toast to men. Ya cállate, Frida says, tries to shut her up. Can we get back to helping Isabel? La Virgen laughs like she's won this one. Here are some more tips, homegirl, La Virgen says. Listen up, chica, because we made them up especially for you. Rule number one, don't get pregnant. Have as much sex as you like, but don't get pregnant. Not until you really, really want to. Believe me, I had 400 sons and a daughter. That was a lot of work. What's worse is, is that this gang of three, some father, son, and ghost, took over my gang while I was spending all my time raising these kids. Now look at this mess. Rule number two, go to school. You're going to have to work the system. Why do you think I appeared like this little virgencita with the cutie pie face to Juan Diego and that fat bishop? I'm working this game, chica. Now look at me. From Chiapas to Chicago, you see me everywhere. Murals, tattoos, books, art. Yeah, Lupe's ladies are all over. Like that crazy vato John Lennon once said about Los Beatles, we're bigger than Jesus Christ. <laughs> Rule number three, you're in charge of your panocha and don't be afraid to protect it. Some guy is always going to try to get into your pants no matter how much you don't want him, even your sweet papacito. Yeah, don't think we don't know about him. If you have to kick some ass to teach him some respect, do it. Rule number four, spread the word. We need to get the word out to all our homegirls and our homeboys, especially the homeboys. Maybe they'll quit with all this macho shit they keep hearing from their families. I think Chuy and his papa may be causing all this. Rule number five, we're all Indias. Don't let your mom fool you. No one's 100%. Be proud of the indígena inside of you. I know your old lady is down on you for behaving like an, ap an Apache, but believe me, we can't all be blonde and blue-eyed. Your mom heard the same lies about the white girls being the only ones worth anything from her own mommy, a pure-blood Tarahumara. Morena, you're beautiful too. Check my little brown self out one of these days, hanging in my gold frame near the altar. I have the place of honor, not those other little wimpy Marias. I'm wasted, but I get the rules down. Suddenly, Frida puts her arm around me. She points to the paper skeletons I hung in a corner for Dia de los Muertos. Look at those skeletons dancing. They're waiting for you, you know. Before you know it, you'll be 50 instead of 15, and you'll wonder where your life went. Don't listen to those crazy sons of bitches you call your parents. You better start fighting them off now before you end up like those baby rats your mother found and drowned. Don't you have any friends, Muñeca? 
That's strange for a girl your age, you know? At your age, I already had a boyfriend and was hanging out with my clica. If you had more vices, you wouldn't care so much. Frida downs another shot of Patron. Man, she wasn't even sweating. This is the most important thing I wanted to tell you. Ms. Herrera thinks you have a good eye for art. I bet you draw circles around your classmates. What do you think? Maybe art should be your vice. That would really drive your parents crazy because they wouldn't understand. Smoking, drinking, and fucking, those things they understand because that's what they grew up with. That's what they lived. Art will be your world. You can create your own reality. Then you can escape this capitalistic quinceañera caca they're trying to feed you. Frida lifts the bowl to her mouth and slurps the rest of her pozole. La Virgen takes another drag from her cigarette, drops it on the floor, and stubs it out with her foot. Listen, preciosa, you'll probably think I'm a miserable pig, but you have to do something before your parents destroy you. Take this advice from me, La Friducha, whom you say you admire so much. Just forget about Father Jorge, all the tias and tios, and just go with your gut. Believe me, you don't want the pelona to get you while you're living some kind of middle class hell. You'll thank me for it later. Frida stands up and looks at her watch. Wait for me, cabrona, La Virgen says as she pulls out her compact mirror and puts on, a, puts on more chocolate brown lipstick. Just because you like going around painted like bozo doesn't mean I have to wait, Frida says. We have other carnalas we gotta help. Hey, I'm not the one going around with a mustache over my lip and eyes. Pinche puta, you want to take it outside? Tranquila, La Virgen says. I'm just kidding, Holmes. They're leaving. I know if I ask them to stay, they won't. If, it, if they meet mom, they'll kill her. We have to go, La Virgen says. Another carnal needs our help. What? You never knew about my badass chola side? Chica, in this crazy world, sometimes you don't have a choice. Before they leave, they both kiss me on the cheek. Frida hugs me real hard. La Virgen leaves me her last cigarette so I can remember her whenever I look at it. I see the brown lipstick mark where she sucked on it. Adios, muñeca, Frida says. Don't forget the rules. Thank you. Thanks to the two of you. Those readings were great. That was really fun. I think I think I, that was my the class you were in was my first the first class I taught at Cornell. Yeah. The, those of you who are new here don't realize we used to do all the readings in this room and we moved across the hall for most of them. And being back in here is very nostalgic. So also seeing all your faces. Um, so I had only planned to just read the bios that the writers sent. But Shane's is so preposterously uh, modest that I, I'll just add a couple of things to it. This is, what, this is what Shane said. Shane Kowalski lives in Pennsylvania. He is a visiting assistant professor in creative writing at Ursinus College. Before this, he worked for the United States Postal Service. He's the author of the very short story collection, Small Moods, which is all true. Uh, my two strongest memories of Shane when he was here what were one of them was uh, I came out of my office in Goldwyn Smith upstairs and was faced with the spectacle of Shane leading his intro creative writing class down the hallway, walking backwards, scribbling in notebooks like fucked up ducklings, as and they were giggling and writing as they walked backwards. And the other one was he Shane took us uh, one of my seminar literature seminars teaching, and he said. He was going to be leading discussion the next day and say, is it okay if I bring my teaching assistant? <laughs> and I said, okay. And the teaching assistant turned out to be a cardboard cutout of his own face, except with, with the baseball cap facing frontwards instead of backwards. <laughs> but this is the kind of thing that you find in Shane's fiction, too. It is all over the place. It's unexpected. Uh, and um, I was talking to my grad students about different kinds of, uh, of careers in fiction writing that you can have and that I really admire a writer who writes a lot of little things and just sends them everywhere to tiny magazines that m may have the lifespan of a, of a gnat, you know, but they're out there. And uh, I love that, that you can always find a Shane Kowalski story somewhere. They're all over the place. And even when you're not reading them, you can, you can hear them like a, 
like a like an ice cream truck five blocks away. It's sort of in the background of your literary life. Um, Small Moods is a great book. I'm really excited about it, and uh, I'm you know Shane's a mensch and a great writer, so I'm very happy to introduce him. Uh, thanks, John. <laughs> Um, I just want to echo my fellow like colleagues in thanking the, the Philip Freund uh, endowment and uh, the MFA program too. It's it's really excellent to see the familiar, friendly faces. I, I miss it. Um, oh, and also I want to thank actually Michael Cook as well before I start. Um, all right. I so the, yeah, the, the the book itself has a lot of uh, small pieces. So I'm just going to blow through these, and we'll see what happens. Um, this first one, oops. This first one is called "I Am Not a Little Teapot." <clears throat> I wasn't good at being a child. My name was Bill. <laughs> when I'm a little teapot would play, I would think. I am not a little teapot. I could physically sense this in my body, the impossibility of it. When other children would sing, <clears throat> I'd think they were liars. I couldn't trust them. Or worse, I could trust them, which meant I was trapped in a world filled with teapots. And so I kept my distance for years, leery of the scalding contents inside them all. <clears throat> Um, this one is called uh, The Country, The Country. My friend, whom I won't name because she was an enemy of the state, lived very far away and not by choice. Every month I made the trip to where she lived in the country. I brought her another month's supply of bread when I went. That is the thing she missed most living where she lived, she'd say, the bread. I was happy to make the long <clears throat> and sometimes fretful trip to where she lived in the country to give her bread. I enjoyed her company. Sometimes something situation-y would happen between us, which was exciting. Last time I saw her, she said she didn't mind living the way she lived. She held a dark loaf of bread in her hands and squeezed it, then remarked that she might get a dog out here. I don't remember the last words I said to her, I often wonder what they were, but I know they won't mean anything now. <clears throat> Next time I visited her, the house where she lived in the country had been ransacked, half burned, spotted with rusty red stains. It wasn't doing a very good job of covering up whatever had taken place there. It was as if something very personal had happened. It's probably best I stop talking about it now. Um, this piece is called I Bought an Octopus. <clears throat> it's one of the longer pieces, actually, which is, I don't know, I guess it's not saying much. Um, I bought an octopus instead of a puppy. I don't know. The woman at the pet store said an octopus comes with very low responsibility. They are their own pets. I wasn't quite sure what that meant. But God damn it, the children were kind of disappointed but I could tell they were also, also interested in the octopus. They stared at it in its big tank that was very expensive. They started to really like it, I think, the octopus. As a, as a family, we stared at the octopus in its tank. I felt great. Like I did something really good for the family. It was a very warm kind of feeling. The children smiled at the octopus. The octopus squish, squished itself into to one of the corners of the tank behind a decorative piece of coral. I don't know about coral, but I thought it was pretty. All the way home, I thought about the coral and not about the octopus. I smiled at my wife, and my wife slightly smiled back at me. It's safe, right, she said. Of course, I said, they're, they're their own pets. She said, what does that mean? I said, it's safe and not a lot of responsibility. Though I wasn't really sure if it was safe and that maybe the responsibility would be too much. I said of course again so she would acquiesce to believe me. Later, uh, later, while the children played with the octopus, I did some research online. I discovered octopi were very, 
very smart and could even climb out of their own tanks. If not for the need of water, they could potentially be our overlord, said one website that was purple colored. I started to think maybe I had made a bad choice. Had I put my family in danger? My forehead, it was wet. I told the children it was time for bed. But dad, they said, no buts, I said, the octopus, the octopus will be there tomorrow. Okay, they said, and went upstairs and pretended to brush their teeth. I checked the tank. The octopus was still behind the decorative coral in the tank. It had not moved. I smiled. I worried too much. We all went to sleep. That night, I had a dream that the octopus climbed out of its tank, bound my wife with six of its arms, and then with the other two arms made love to my wife. After it was done with her, it went for the children. Then I woke up. I went downstairs and checked the expensive tank. The octopus was still there. I stared at it, and it stared at me in the dark. That's really messed up, said my wife in the morning after I told her my dream. Having senses of humor, we both chuckled at this strange dream, uncomfortably, sipping coffee. Was it so strange? I wondered, had I put my family in danger? Just to be sure, I got rid of the octopus later that day. The woman at the pet store shrugged and said something that pretty much meant octopi are not for everyone. I handed over the octopus. I handed over the tank. I kept the decorative coral. I don't know. Some things are worth it. Driving home, a song of optimistic yelling came on the radio, and I took it as a sign I had done the right thing. I would tell the children the octopus died. That would be the easiest thing to do. So they wouldn't know I was a fucking coward. Irresponsible fucking coward. I shook my head at myself while parked at a red light, exercising myself of the deep blue shame inside me. I touched the coral and somehow communicated my anxiety into it, and it shimmered. I drove home. The children were sad. I gave them ice cream cones. But how did it die, said one of them. I shrugged my shoulders. I had failed to think up a good death for the octopus. Goddamn. Fucking loser. It got very old, I said. I explained to them that maybe we could eventually get a puppy one day. Oh, okay, they said. They stood there licking the ice cream cones down to nothing. Later, we all went to sleep. And after a while, I woke up in the dead of night. I could hear the soft hum of ocean. I went downstairs. I looked at the empty spot where the tank had been. My wife put a vase with old, soon-to-go flowers there. I stared at the vase of flowers. The vase of flowers stared back. The possible worlds we get to live in are out there. The problem is we get to choose. Um, just maybe a couple more here. Uh, this one is called, if I can find it, it's called No Change Here. Um, and I think uh, I have a couple of these that are kind of like, I'm trying to do autofiction, but also not. Like, uh, I'm trying to do like, false autofiction. So this one's called No Change Here. Uh, when someone says change, I think they're saying shame. Even if I know very clearly and contextually that what they are saying is change, I will hear shame. Be the shame you want to see in the world. <laughs> a shame is going to come. When people call me on the phone, I'll usually say, sorry, but change isn't here, and I hang up. Um, this one, uh, this one is, uh, I was, uh, I, I like to sometimes watch Lifetime movies, and uh, this was kind of inspired, this is like my own version of a Lifetime movie. It's called uh, The Exact Shape of Hawaii. A young man knocks on, her do knocks on her door one day after she has fallen into a deep nap and says he is her long-lost son. No, you're not, she says. My son has been missing for 15 years. Look at the birthmark, he says, and shows her the birthmark. She gasps when she sees the birthmark, the same as her long-lost son's birthmark, the exact shape of Hawaii. She says, come, come in, and he comes in, and she fills him in on the life he's missed for the last 15 years. His brother's marriage, very wonderful, rose gold candlesticks. The death of Grinch, good old pup, 
and the death of his own father, zapped by a malfunctioning outlet. He sits there and receives it all. Wow, he says. Wait until your brother sees you, she says. This, this is a miracle. Our family is coming back together. She, see, she sleeps dreadfully that night. She, th she thinks of all the times when her youngest son first went missing that she had the thought that it was the wrong son who went missing. She would say it out loud. Her husband would scold her when she said it out loud while lying in bed waiting for sleep to snip the dead bloom of day away. She didn't feel guilty then in the moment and perhaps even said, said it to receive the scolding, but she had, she had felt guilt ever since. It felt like drinking a cold glass of water after being thirsty for many days. Now that, now that he's back, it is a chance to begin fresh, she thinks. She goes and listens in on him while he sleeps in his old room, noiseless, neutral, home. The next day, the brothers are reunited. So you're really him, the older brother says. I missed you, brother, says the young man. But the brother is suspicious. He asks to see the birthmark and nods when he sees it. He hugs his long-lost brother as if he's hugging a shape of something that is smoldering. We'll throw a party as a homecoming, the mother says, wrapping around her boys like a lasso. Later, when it's dark and everyone in the world that he knows is sleeping, the older brother begins to think. For 15 years, he has known only one kind of life. He thinks he hears a clock ticking in the house somewhere, but they do not own any ticking clocks. He gets up in bed, careful not to disturb his wife, who sleeps like a dead pope. He walks through his house, the one he and his wife bought with the money from their livings. When he thinks of his brother, he thinks of him with quotation marks around him, his brother. Where has he been? What has he been doing with his life all this time? He wanders to the big globe in his office and spins it to the Pacific Ocean, pinning his fingertip just under Hawaii. He looks at it. He hears a creaking. Somewhere out and out in all the dark of the world is your life waiting for you to fall asleep so it can do its work. Um, and I, uh, one last one I'll read here. It's, um, it's, the first, uh, it's the first story in the collection. Um, it's also, like I said, maybe it's autofiction, but there's no way to verify it, I guess. I guess I could ask my parents, but I don't want to, really. Um, it's called A Good Start. The day I was born, I came out vomiting. The doctor looked at me vomiting in his gloved hands and started vomiting. The nurses, one had a mole on her face that was, that was admirable, started vomiting. My father, readying the scissors to cut the cord, started vomiting. My mother, seeing my father uh, vomiting and, and admiring him to a sick degree, started vomiting. I remember, because I have a very good memory, that I saw everyone else around me vomiting in the delivery room. And because it revolts me, as most things do when people try and emulate me, I stopped vomiting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Reke Aoki's first novel, Hemele Ahilo, was published by Topside Press in 2014. She is a two-time Lambda Literary Award finalist for her collection, Seasonal Velocities, and Why Dust Shall Never Settle Upon This Soul. Reke's work has appeared or been recognized in publications including Vogue, Elle, Bustle, Autostraddle, Pop Sugar, and BuzzFeed, as well as the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. Her most recent novel is Light from Uncommon Stars, and it was a national bestseller, and recognized as one of the best science fiction and fantasy books of 2021 by Barnes & Noble, Kirkus, Goodreads, BookPage, and the New York Public Library. Rika has been honored by the California State Senate for extraordinary commitment to the visibility and well-being of transgender people, and she's currently a professor of English at Santa Monica College. Rika, welcome back. So I came through the program, I finished up in 1992, so I think I'm kind of one of the senior members of our cohort here. And uh, just, uh, I wanted to put a quick thank you to Bob Morgan, who um, 
It's really interesting. You get help from the strangest places. Uh, just letting everybody know, my mother passed away um, at the end of, uh, well, just a couple weeks ago, and she was being cremated while I was on the airplane here. Odd feeling that because I could never share with my mother who I became and the work that I produced as Rika. However, you find family where you go, and I remember telling Bob, you know, yeah, well, I'm transgender, and he said, well, trans, travel. Well, you always liked traveling. That's something every writer should do. <laughs> and um, I, uh, a goofy, dorky place that I call home, my, my agent said, you're going to be OK? And I said, I'll be fine. I'm coming to Ithaca. It's home. So. I'm going to be reading just a little bit from Light from Uncommon Stars. Uh, unlike everybody else, kind of like everyone's writing these really cool short stories. This is from a novel. So um, you may not catch all the references, which kind of resembles my entire first year in the MFA program. Um, but um, this is just letting you know it has to do with a curse. And there's a dogwood bow that is actually a curse. And it has to, and her. Um, Katrina's uh, violinist named Aubergine Eggplant. So there we are. And then it was her turn. Katrina was led to an area off stage. She picked up Aubergine and kissed her. In all this, you've been innocent. I'm sorry. Katrina reached for the dogwood bow. She wasn't afraid of it. She didn't hate it. In a way, it was just as helpless as she was. And besides, it was this bow that would set her teacher free. The announcer began her introduction. You may have seen our next musician's videos, I mean, if you're into that sort of thing. Performing a medley of gaming music, please welcome transgender activist and artist and violinist Katrina Wynn. With Aubergine and her dogwood bow, Katrina walked onto the stage. That was crass and tasteless. This had been like no competition Shizuka had been part of. Why even mention being transgender? The girl was here to be a musician. Why couldn't they have just let her say her name and let her perform? Look, the audience was already beginning to snicker. And then Shizuka noticed that Katrina held her dogwood bow. What? She's made her choice, Shizuka. There is nothing you can do except enjoy the performance, the voice of the demon said in her hand. As if to underscore Shizuka's helplessness, the announcer kept going. Uh, before you start, the announcer said, I mean, you look great. I mean, there's no way I'd ever have the guts to go on stage dressed like that. The audience laughed as if this were the funniest thing in the world. Katrina shrugged and smiled innocently. Well, it's really not so different from sex work. The laughter stopped. There was muttering and uncomfortable shifting as Katrina turned to the crowd. What had Miss Satomi said? There are a lot of different ways to fuck on camera or on stage. The stage lights were far brighter than they were in the park. There, were no way, there was no way her eyes would adjust. She would be facing this wall of darkness the entire time. Whatever. She didn't need to see their faces to know what they wanted. The crowd wanted to be entertained. Mr. Tso wanted her body, the demon wanted her soul, and what did she want? She wanted a glass of tangerine juice and one more breakfast with her teacher. And with that, Katrina looked into the darkness and began. Wait, though. This music wasn't from a video game. What was it? A few started to laugh. Many scratched their heads. But a few of the judges sat upright. They recognized that, yes, this was a deviation from the program, but this was no joke. This wasn't video game music. This was Bartok. This was a sonata for solo violin. First movement, tempo G, chicana. Chicana, chicana, chicong. A swirling, shifting dance, usually composed in triple meter. If this were Vivaldi, it would drip with sentiment and romance. If this were Handel, it would sing and sparkle with heaven's joy. But this was Bartok. 
There seemed no clear way to classify this. The violins spoke in such contradictory voices, with, without, against each other. Even the key seemed to be morphing between major and minor and irrelevant. Miss Satomi had warned her that listeners would find this confusing, alien, even incorrect. But for someone who had played her entire life in multiple parts to similar reactions, this was the music Katrina knew was hers. Might they think she was queer, trans, an abomination? Might they think she was ugly? Might they find her entrancing, exotic, or grotesque, or horrifying? Might she not care? Because as she played, Katrina began to realize that, yes, she was staring into a wall of darkness, but didn't that also mean that the lights were on her? Didn't that mean that the stage was hers? And how was this different from doing webcams when any of these faceless viewers might log on one night and pay to see her come? The audience wanted transgender. They would get transgender or queer or whatever they wanted, but they would also get her. And she was beautiful. Listen to me. Listen to me now, for if this dogwood bow can force beauty upon you, then I shall shove every part of myself into that beauty. I shall make you feel all the joy and all the terror in loving who you are. The audience might have wanted to turn away, but the cursed bow rendered them helpless. Katrina played a love song smashed against a wall, a dream for a child left beaten in their bed. As Aubergine wailed in Katrina's hands, there was more shifting, more confusion. As the Chacona held them, aroused them, touched their secrets, made them ache for that happy ending to come. But instead, silence. Because too many stories end unfinished because that's all freaks like us get. At the first movement ended, a few people faithfully applauded what they shouldn't. And with that mistake in the applause, Katrina knew her soul was damned. Who would have thought that one's destiny could be sealed, not by some parting of the sky, not the horror of an, eternal, an infernal flame, but with just a few awkward twitters and a shh. Well, at least no one was asking her to leave the stage. And if she were to be damned for all eternity, she sure as hell could hold them for the entire performance. Second movement, fuga, risoluto, non troppo vivo. Mention fugue, and one thinks immediately of Bach's perfect universe of divine watchmakers and transcendent harpsichords. But the universe is not perfect, is it? Fuga, fugue a theme introduced by one part and successively taken up by others. Because, but counterpoint is not always harmonious, not always consensual. There are threats and arguments and empty apologies and messy excuses and blame, 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 fuga, derived from fugera, to flee. Girl clothes, boy clothes, money, birth certificate, social security card, toothbrush, spare glasses, backup battery, makeup, estradiol, spironolactone, and fugare to chase, risoluto, non troppo vivo, resolutely, but not too alive, as how you smile when a stranger spits at you, as how you keep breathing while a friend rapes you, as how you think calmly as a parent is kicking down your door. Yehudi Menuhin himself claimed that Bartok's fugue was perhaps the most aggressive and brutal music he had ever performed. But as Katrina realized, such brutality made her neither nervous nor afraid. She was not intimidated. Instead, she was angry. How long had she lived in this fuga with a fake smile and a fake nod? How long had she buried her face and her voice in order to placate others? How often did she say that her voice was too ugly to be heard anyway? Harmonize, compliment, counterpoint, apologize, apologize, apologize again. But why? Why did it have to be that way? To live a lie? To save her soul? At least with the cursed bow in her hand, her damnation made sense. Dash around the corner, lock the door. Into the dark, she hurled arpeggios of catcalls and internet trolls. There was a customer clawing at her hair, and here was another one biting her and drawing blood. These were people liking a post saying she'd be set on fire. This was a penis forcing itself bluntly into her mouth. 
This is the song of the queer kid who escapes from a window to a sidewalk in the middle of the night. This is the song of a trans girl just wanting a fucking bathroom in the middle of the day. So what if you don't understand? So what if you think I'm a half-woman freak? This is my song. I'm on stage right now, and my voice leads. Katrina glared up from Aubergine at the audience she could not see. But then she sensed something completely unexpected. Some of them seemed to be singing, too. Fuga, a theme introduced by one part and successively taken up by others. Somehow other voices, other musics began to interweave with her own. The notes, the harmonies wrapped her gently like a blanket night in a field of stars. She wanted to reach out, tell them she didn't know. She had no idea that they could have been with her. To tell them that they could never, they would never, they would never, ever be alone. But then she remembered their reactions were merely due to the dogwood bow. Third movement, Melodia Adagio. Adagio. Even people who didn't know music knew the sweeping, inescapable sadness of Barber or Albinoni. A song of mourning, a song of loss. Yet, unlike Barber or Albinoni, Bartok did not title his movement Adagio. Instead, he titled it Eloria. Katrina thought of her mother arranging pork buns and tamales in the big family steamer. She remembered her father's steady voice as he taught her how to tie shoelaces. He could taste, she could taste the turkey legs and funnel cakes she shared with her cousins that afternoon at the LA County Fair. She saw her teacher smiling when she told her parents that their son had a natural gift for violin, and the Thanksgiving, both her father and uncle declared to the family that they would stop drinking and they toasted with sparkling cider. But it is not, it is not enough to blindly flee pain or danger. It is not enough to escape from some irredeemable enemy. Heartache, heartache comes from glimpsing over one's shoulders, the yearning for thanksgiving, the persistent memory of sweetness. Breaking comes from knowing exactly how it could have been. Sadness and regret, these come from more than just being a victim or an innocent survivor. They come from seeing wasted chance after wasted chance after wonderful, wonderful, wonderful wasted chance. They come from knowing all the good that has slipped through your fingers as well. <sighs> you selfish little thing. How do we mourn when we know that we too have been cruel to both the living and the dead? For all the lifetimes of being mistreated, broken, lost. For all the lifetimes of bullying, betraying, cowardice, and shame. Yes, there is music as this. And yes, this music is you. Fourth movement. Presto. Presto, very fast. Fast as if by, ma by magic. At the fourth movement, some people thought, the flight of the bumblebee, finally a passage they could recognize. But this was no overplayed Rimsky-Korsakov insect. This was the frantic chaos of refugees escaping a war. So, a scream? Yet some of the more astute observers had noticed that she had put a mute on her violin. So was that a whisper? Was the pizzicato to be jarring or soothing? Was the counterpoint ex expected or welcome or unexpected or a surprise? Throughout the sonata, throughout each movement, the audience felt, felt, see, seen, believed who they were, what they valued, whom they loved, but what could they be sure? Where was truth? Could truth ultimately be? Where does truth ultimately lie? Presto. What is magic anyway? If magic is more than the illusions on a stage, if magic can actually change the world, then what is reality but a song one imagines and sets free? The fourth movement held the most infamous feature of Bartok's entire sonata, quarter tones. These were the tones between the piano keys, the notes between notes. Here is where the fingerboard shows nowhere, for these are the signs of bad intonation, or even worse, a bad ear. 
Yehudi Menuhin had asked Bartok to re rewrite the section conventionally, not only because of its technical difficulty, but because to him the deviation seemed unnecessary. Unnecessary? Why did Bartok write this for violin? After all, he was a pianist. Why write for the violin even while dying of leukemia? Why did Miss Satomi teach her? After all, she was the queen of hell. Why spare her student even as she was dying for souls? Unnecessary? Here, with her fingers in the in-between places, Katrina played a deviation that the instrument thought was wrong, that the audience thought was wrong, that everything she had learned about music and intonation and harmony she thought was wrong. Here, even where Aubergine's resonance became cold and far away, Katrina blew, drew that bow across the strings, smoothly, quickly, roughly, flirtatiously, desperately. Cursed or not, she drew her bow across as she would draw her breath. Queer or not, she would play with a cursed bow and be called an abomination. Trans or not, deviant or not, that did not mean there was anything wrong with her love. Miss Satomi had once told her that the violin's difficulty is one of the greatest mistruths in all the history of music. For there are only four strings tuned in perfect fifths. The relationships between the courses are inviolate. One's hand rests in familiar places and positions, whether one is playing a melody up and along one string or over to the next. When you are in tune, the entire instrument sings in sympathetic resonance. But when it stops singing, what then? Standing alone, Katrina looked into the darkness and from her own emptiness, and her own hollows played the music that she knew for herself was right. And suddenly Katrina realized how much she was enjoying herself. Tomorrow she would be gone. She would miss Astrid and Miss Satomi. She'd miss Shirley so very much, but they would all be fine. Katrina thanked Bella, Victor, Janos, Bartok, and sent him a prayer. For here, where in his in-between notes, in his lonely intonations, she had said everything she needed to say. In the dissonances and in the off-tones beyond the reach of the piano, beyond even her aubergine, Katrina would now be fine as well. For stripped of familiarity, of decency, of hoped, even damned, she realized more powerfully than ever that her music, this music, still holds. Before a befuddled audience she could not see, Katrina held and was held, and to them Katrina Wen played her farewell. It was a song of neither forgiveness, nor gratitude, nor of trust, nor of anything else the world might think she have owned. Instead, she offered her love and her truth. Regardless of whether or not they recognized them as such, she offered all the music she had that they might hear their own music and play. And then Katrina glanced at the dogwood bow, and it was as if the entire weight of her teacher's curse shifted upon her, for she realized this night had already been a lie. Thank you. Our spring 2023 Zelaznik reading series schedule will be announced pretty soon. Keep an eye on our website, get onto our mailing list if you want, and we'll send you that information. Uh, and please come back and listen. Uh, and if you'll stay where you are, we'll, uh, we'll bring the writers back up. Hello, everybody. I have the very uh, easy task of handing the certificates to the writers and I'm going to invite them uh, as I read your name to come and collect this. I've held on to your check. I promise you'll have that um, in due time. So I'll begin with Manuel. Congrats. <laughs> Okay, we can we can do it again. Okay, so uh, Shane. Rika. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> okay, uh, Estella. <laughs> He's on the way there. Oh, there you are. Can we come uh, to the middle so we can all see everybody? All right. Can you give a big hand to me? Upstairs. 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 Upstair